see you who are here here and uh, we know that a lot of our folks aren't going to be able to make it for certain reasons and we understand that and those of us who are here we are glad you're here be careful you know we're not going to be doing the handshaking and the hugging uh, meet and greet thing for a while they've asked us to be careful about a lot of different things if you are sick you know you should stay away and some of our folks uh, are struggling with certain things so they're in that category if you're not healthy you know we don't want what you're not healthy about so to speak and uh, School's been canceled for the next couple of weeks at least for our children. So that complicates our daycare. We are gonna stay open. In fact, we're gonna be more busy than usual because the before and after school kids, 40 children about that we take care of for an hour or so before and an hour or so after school, we're gonna have them all day long, nine, 10 hours, you know. So we're gonna be hiring new uh, staff, more hours and such, and uh, it'll get complicated. Uh, pray for our staff because, you know, they're in a stressful situation too. I'm around, I'll be available, but uh, things will be a little different. You know, they've restricted the visits into nursing homes and hospitals in many ways. I should tell you, I did get sick this week and I had some concern having been in France for a while. So I went to the ER and uh, was tested and I have been cleared. They uh, got back to me right away in a couple days and I found that out and I am relieved. I, uh, I wouldn't wanna be responsible for uh, anyone else getting sick. I got a call yesterday from Betty Williams and she lost a niece in California to the coronavirus. So in our extended church family already, it has affected us. Although I don't think there's anybody in our county that has tested positive. And we wanna keep it that way. And we wanna be careful. But let's pray for one another and pray for our country. Um, you know, our president has set aside today as a national day of prayer. And he's asked churches all over the country to be praying for our nation and our world. So let's go to prayer and ask the Lord for those very things. Almighty God, we bow in your presence. You said, cast your care upon you. So Lord, we try to do that. We want to just drop all of our anxieties and our cares upon you because you care for us. And Lord, you've told us to come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find mercy and grace to help in our time of need. Lord, we beg you for mercy because we deserve punishment, sinful as we all are, Lord. If you weren't merciful, none of us would stand. And Lord, we want to find grace in our time of need. The goodness that you give in Christ is so precious. And Lord, we are your people. We have found mercy and grace at your hand before. And Lord, you have saved us and guaranteed us eternity in heaven with Christ. Lord, the measure of health that you allow us to enjoy, we don't always know how long we will live, how long you will allow us on this old earth. But Lord, we pray that you would stay this plague, that it is sweeping our world. People are scared on every continent. And Lord, it is <clears throat> no respecter of persons. And much like the plague that you sent on Israel because of their sin, Lord, you allowed Moses and Aaron to stand and make atonement for them. And you heard their prayer. 
and the plague was stayed. So Lord, we intercede for our nation, for our loved ones. We pray like Moses and Aaron that you would hear our prayers and forgive our sin and heal our land. <coughs> Lord, we are simple folk. We don't deserve anything, but you are a great God and you've called us and commanded us even to come and to come boldly, so we do. <coughs> Here we are, Lord, in your house, grateful people, grateful for what you have given us and we have been so blessed. And Lord, we grieve for those who are uh, sick and uh, struggling Doctors don't seem to have any cure for this particular virus yet. And uh, it's scary because of that. But Lord, we pray to you, the great physician, Dr. Jesus. We love you, Lord, and you know the cure. You have the answers that we need. But mostly, Lord, for our heart problems. So we pray for every man, woman, boy, and girl. They need you, Lord. And maybe in this difficult, stressful time, people will be thinking of eternity and their readiness or lack thereof for meeting their maker. Help us to be bold, help us to be willing to share, help us, Lord, to be the spokesperson for you in this dark land. And I pray for our missionaries all around the world to be able to do the same thing. They too are in stressful, situations no doubt and many of them in places that are uh, very difficult my daughter and her family in france are right in the middle of a, uh, an area that has been hard hit and lord it, it's difficult for billions of people so we are your people we we pray in your mighty name and we know that you hear us and Lord, I pray that there are millions of other Christians right now in churches all over the country and the world who are praying. And I know you are a great God. You can hear every one of our prayers. You can hear our hearts whisper. You know even before we think. So we pray with faith and we pray believing. And we ask you, Lord, to bless this church, this service as we worship you, Lord. We come together because we're your people. And we pray you will bless us and help those who are working with our children down the hall as well while we worship here. And for all those who may be watching on uh, Facebook or listening in on the internet, oh Lord, suit a blessing for each one. We pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now, if you had a bulletin, there's a few things you ought to change. Tomorrow, the Women on Mission's been rescheduled for next month. So Nancy Hudler hasn't been feeling well, and uh, the coffee connection tomorrow morning has been canceled as well. Planning to do those things tomorrow morning, or next month. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, we are still planning to go ahead at Andrew and Chrissy's for the second episode of The Chosen, if you'd like uh, to come. And we are planning to go ahead and do all of our Wednesday night services with the children, with the youth, and with our prayer meeting. We are going to reschedule our business meeting that we had to cancel last Wednesday night, so we'll have that this Wednesday night. Anything else we should mention? All right, let's take our hymn books and sing number 16, if you will. We're not going that one? We're not going to do 16. Forget that. I'm going to step aside. Good morning, we're going to do Stand in Your Love, so please join us this morning. Listen to the words of this song. If you have any fears about this, just remember you can trust in Jesus. Yeah. 
special class, we've been asking the kids to write down questions that they'd like us to deal with. And one of the questions we answered today was, is Jesus really God? Very interesting. We looked at some Greek word studies actually in there. Um, but part of what we discussed was the reaction of the centurion and those other soldiers with him who crucified Jesus after the crucifixion. So let me just read a few verses out of the Amplified Bible. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep in death were raised to life. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, observed the earthquake and all that was happening, they were terribly frightened and filled with awe, and they said, truly, this was God's son. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we also say that you are truly God's Son. There's no one else like you. You are Lord and God in every sense of the word. This morning we bring before you those who are in special need of your healing touch. We bring before you David Brandenburg and Richard Bracefield, the family of Somi Dondre, Kyle Hudler, Carol Weaver. We also pray for those in the Coast Guard and their chaplains. And we thank you for Chris and Obelaska Hurley and Bernice Jackson here in the church. We pray for Pete and Wendy Scott, missionaries. Lord, we ask for your presence to be bold and obvious in our lives. Help us to remember that you are the one who said, I will never leave you, I'll never forsake you. We were to cast all of our care upon you for you truly care for us. So this morning, and this week have to help us to walk in our lives dependent on who you are, recognizing that you are Lord of every situation you already know, the beginning and the end. Help us to remember that you are a gracious, loving God, and you care for us as your dearly loved and precious children. So we commit to you our lives and as we walk upon your earth this week, help us to remember that you are with us, that we can trust you and you've asked us to trust you and not be afraid. So we commit to you our lives and those who are on our hearts and that we are praying for this morning in Jesus' name.
Before the children are dismissed, we have a little bit of special music, Jane Brandenburg. And it's so short that it would probably take me longer to get up there than get back, so I'll just do it from here. I'm a loud mouth. So. Um, <clears throat> this is the first song that I taught. I used to teach scripture songs to kids at, at a school and um, did that for years, but uh, this is the first song I ever taught them. And I thought it might come in handy for nowadays for us. Um, although I suspect that the people who are here today are the ones who aren't as afraid of as some are. But uh, we don't have to be afraid of anything if we're in God's hands. Um, even when you consider, quote, worst case scenario, hey, can't threaten me with heaven. <laughs> but anyway, the verse is from Psalms, and it's, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Told you it was short. Amen. But I could do it once more just because it is so short. <laughs> the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And for you kids, that's called a rhetorical question. The answer is nobody. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Brother Dave is going to take our children. mentioned that today is the Ides of March, and uh, the President has called for a National Day of Prayer, and uh, I have not heard that on any newscast. Have you? No, it's like they don't talk about that. On Fox. It was on Fox? Okay, good. I got word on my uh, email from Samaritan's Purse, Franklin Graham mentioned it, and uh, we surely can pray. And there's a verse in Hebrews 4, 16 that says, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence, okay? King James says boldness, come boldly. So when we come, there are two things. The Lord says we can receive mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve, the punishment that we deserve. And it says we can also find grace to help in our time of need. Grace is getting what we don't deserve, the goodness of God at Christ's expense. So mercy, not getting what we do deserve. Grace, getting what we don't deserve. And he says, come boldly to God because you don't deserve it. You, you're, you're not worthy. Okay, we know that. And Yet he says, I want you, I want you to come. So let's bow in prayer, and maybe several of you would, would lead us and just pray. And uh, Brother Ed, would you lead out? Several of you might pray, and I'll close. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for uh, who you are. Father, we just thank you for this time in the course of history and in the events of prophecy and the things that are befalling not only our nation but the globe. And we just do pray for a special work at this time that you would use your church, your people, Lord, to be on high alert, to be in the mission field. Just pray for our president and the decisions that are made and uh, the way uh, that this pestilence uh, that's come, Lord, might be uh, received.
yourself in the person of your son. And we thank you for these many years that we have had the, the joy and the stability of living in that position before you. Uh, we pray that this will be a great time uh, while we'll be experiencing this testing and testing even in the sense of fear. Lord, it's just something that uh, we see has gripped us right around our little northeast, right in Walmart, right in Food Lot, and anywhere that people are praying. And Father, we pray that we can, that you will open up opportunities which they appear to be all the time around us to testify of your protection and testify of our faith um, that we can have the peace, the peace of God that passes the understanding of things that are going on in the little world around us. We know that you are coming back to that. You are a God of love for us. And regardless of tribulations that we will go through, you will be there for us. And we thank you for um, decisions that have been made. I assume that they're according to your will on the upper level. Uh, we pray for these this two-week period that's ahead for the schools and the families, the finances, all of these things that cause us to fear. We are so comfortable in this nation. So we're just looking forward in faith uh, to what you're going to accomplish during this time. In Jesus' name. Dear Father, I want to thank you for this day that you have made for us. And my prayer today is for the doctors and the scientists and the nurses that are dealing with this. I just want to thank you for giving them wisdom to, to study and to find a cure for this virus, dear Father. If it's your will, I ask this in my prayer today. Dear Lord, I know that fear can be contagious, and, and I know that newspapers love to make people afraid, um, but I ask that uh, you have our peace be contagious. Let us spread your peace, really. Let us spread uh, your, the idea that you are in control, total control, God. And we can rest in you. Um, no matter what comes our way, if, well, something's going to come our way, no matter what it is. But um, uh, let us realize how in control you really are. And that you love us. faith. We come boldly because you've told us to come and we ask that, Lord, for our loved ones and for our church family, for those that work in places that might be high risk, those that work in the hospitals and nursing home, Lord, especially we think of our most vulnerable population and we pray your watch care over us. Like Moses and Aaron, we pray for those in our family, Lord, and we ask you to have mercy upon us. If you would judge us, Lord, none of us would stand. So we beg you in Christ's stead that uh, you forgive us and cleanse us, and heal our land. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <coughs>
Well, for the last number of months, we have been in the book of Psalms, and uh, I'm going to turn to the New Testament now for a little while, to the book of Romans. Paul says here, I am not ashamed of the gospel, and we have a chance to preach, to teach, to share, to witness in this day and age, this week, like no other time. People are attentive. People will listen. They, many are scared. If you don't know salvation, if you don't have the assurance of your eternal life being in the hands of the Lord, you want to know what if. And people will talk. People will listen. And you and I, we need to be a witness and be ready to share a witness. And like Paul, <clears throat> not be ashamed. Uh, don't just sort of apologize and such. Take that opportunity. And uh, Paul wrote this book of Romans from Corinth on his third missionary journey. He had never been to Rome. He wanted to. It was the capital of the Roman Empire, after all. It's where the, the power lie laid. So he wanted to go there. He wanted to be there, but he hadn't been there. But he knew a lot of people there because uh, maybe folks that he had led to the Lord had moved there. And there's a church there. So he's writing this book of Romans to them. And Paul wrote 13 of the books in the New Testament. And this is not the first one chronologically, but it is the first one in the order of his books because it, more than any other, is like a theology of what Paul preached wherever he went. As a missionary for Jesus, he shared the gospel. And Romans sort of falls out like an explanation of the gospel. Uh, in many ways, the uh, book of Romans is uh, one of those sort of books you could study. Uh, Martin Luther said we ought to memorize it word for word. Every Christian should know it uh, word for word. It was the book that woke Martin Luther up in the... Uh, dark ages. He was uh, being ordained as a doctor of divinity in the Roman Catholic Church in the early 1500s. He was roaming through the shelves of the library there in the University of Wittenberg where he was and he came across a book he had never seen before in his life. It was the Bible. And he was almost an, a doctor of divinity getting ready to be a priest, but all he had ever been taught were the 52 passages, one for each week of the year, that he would teach every year after year for the rest of his life. Uh, and then he found the Bible. <laughs> now, it wasn't in German because it hadn't been translated in his language, but it was written in Latin, <clears throat> and he knew Latin, and he started to read it. And the Lord opened his eyes. When he got to the book of Romans, it was this book that became uh, the watchword of the Reformation. Romans 1.17 says, The just shall live by faith. And it was that faith, that simple faith, that uh, Martin Luther realized was the message of the Bible. That was the gospel. That was the good news. All his life he had been working, 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 striving, trying to please God, trying to be uh, worthy, trying to work hard enough to make it. And he never had assurance of his salvation until he read this book and the Lord opened his eyes. And the world's never been the same. Uh, we're going to read it and uh, maybe look at it in this way. As I read these first 17 verses, three times Paul's going to say, I am. And then something after that. See if you can find them. The Son of God, by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, 
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness. How constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel, also to you who are at Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith, from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. May God add his blessing to his word. Well, did you find them? The uh, three I am's of Paul, uh, I'll call this, he says in verse 14, I am obligated, uh, I'm a debtor, uh, the King James says, uh, I am eager to <coughs> preach, verse 15, and verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Okay. So, we just lost my feed there, Andrew. All right, we're back online here. Okay. So, let's take a look at what Paul is saying here in this first few verses. He, he begins by saying he's a debtor. He's obligated to preach. He has a message that the world needs. And he has been called by God to preach it. So he begins this book by sort of giving us his credentials, if you will. He says, first of all, I'm a slave, a bond slave, a servant of Christ Jesus. Uh, the Greek word translated servant is doulos, and it's this word for a slave that voluntarily bound himself to his master. They would uh, bore a hole in his earlobe, you know, to sight, by a visible sign that I did this. I am becoming your servant. Maybe you were paying off a debt for six years and your debt has been paid, but you found out that, you know, serving this man uh, was good. He took care of you and provided food and shelter and clothes for your family. And a man could, in Israel, uh, do that. And Paul uses that word to describe his relationship with God, with Jesus Christ. I have voluntarily bound myself to a new master. I'm no longer a servant of sin. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, Amen. a bond slave of him. And then he says, I've been called to be an apostle. The word apostle is uh, like a messenger that's sent, okay? The uh, 12 disciples were called disciples, which means followers of Jesus, until after the resurrection. And then they're no longer called disciples, they're called apostles. Uh, they are now being sent. Jesus is no longer on the earth for them to follow like a disciple, but he has gone to heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within them and to go with them and be in them. And they are sent by the Spirit of God to the ends of the world. And Paul says, I was one of those sent by God. He said, in fact, 
I was set apart to be a preacher of the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter, you know, he was a, an apostle to the Jews. And he pretty much stayed in Jerusalem and sort of uh, was in charge of the church as it spread throughout the world. But not Paul. Paul was called specifically by God and sent to go to the Gentiles. And so he became what most would acknowledge was the greatest missionary who ever lived. And he established churches throughout the then known world. He's writing from Corinth, where he's been several times. There's a big church there. He's written two books to them. But now he's writing a book to this church in Rome where he's never been. He wants to go there, but he's never been there. So he's trying to let them know who he is. He's heard of them, but maybe they've heard of him, maybe not. So then he says this, I am ready. I am eager to come. I want to come. I've never been to Rome, but it's the capital of the empire, and I want to be there. So notice his concern, because he says a few things. In verse 8, he says, I'm thankful. I've heard about you. I've never been there, but he says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. <laughs> That's pretty good. And uh, I like that, to think, you know, that people knew about them. In that day and age, it took a while for news to travel. They didn't have the internet, didn't have cell phones, you know, didn't have the kind of things that we just turn the TV on and we can see anything around the world. Uh, the instant it happens. But Paul says, news has traveled, and I know about your faith. There was a church there already in this capital city. And he said, I want to come. And I said, I heard about you, and I'm thankful to God. In fact, he said, I pray for you all the time ever since I heard about you and I pray for you I remember you in my prayers at all times and I pray that now at last by God's will the way may be open for me to come to you this is sort of you know this situation may be like what I experienced trying to go to India uh, you know I heard about this ministry that was going on of reaching India through orphans and the Bible college that we support, and I wanted to go. I wanted to see them. I wanted to meet them, but it didn't work out. You know, the harder I tried, the, the, the worse it got. And it, You know, it was difficult to get a visa, and then it was more expensive than uh, it should have been because of all those problems I was having, but God wanted me to go, and I wanted to go, and it worked out eventually, and then they passed a law that you can't try to win someone to Christ. It's against the law. You can go to jail for that. And I'm thinking, you know, are you sure you want me there, God? And I think, yeah. I, all right, I guess I'm willing. I'm not particularly interested in going to jail. But, uh, you know, that's sort of where Paul was. He said, I don't care. I want to come. He didn't know, you know, he would be there in a few years in jail. In fact, he was going to be given a free ride to Rome on a prison ship <laughs> in irons, and it was going to be shipwrecked, you know, and he was almost, you know, killed uh, a number of times along the way, but God got him there, and he was eventually going to make it to this congregation, and he says, I long to see you. In fact, he said, I am in your debt. I'm a debtor to you because God sent me to the Gentiles and I want to go where nobody else has gone before, take the gospel where no one else has preached it. And he said, I want to get to Rome. After all, it's the capital. It's where stuff happens. And it'd be us like us going to Washington, D.C. and trying to set up a church there in that circle of power where, you know, the world's decisions are made that shape the world. Uh, well, Paul kind of had that in his mind, too. In fact, he said, I am eager to come. I want to come. So, he says, I am a 
debtor. I am ready, obligated even, to come. And he says, I am not ashamed. So the third I am is I am not ashamed of the gospel of God. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, but then to the Gentile. And God had called him to go to the Gentiles. Now, what he says about the gospel is very uh, interesting because he has great confidence. Uh, we've seen his credentials, his concerns, now his great confidence in the gospel. He calls it the gospel of God. The word gospel means good news. It's an interesting word that was coined in Greek by two words. Uh, it, it means literally good news, good news. Uh, eu, E-U, is a, a, a prefix that we put on some of our words, like at a funeral, someone gives a eulogy, E-U, logos, a good word. Uh, the good news is eu angelos in Greek. Angelos is the word for angel. An angel is a messenger. And in this case, it's the message, good message, okay? Eu angelos. That's the, the Greek word for the gospel. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the good news. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the gospel of God. This is God's plan from start to finish. This was what God did. In the Old Testament, it was different content of faith, but it was always by faith. And in the New Testament now, we know Jesus has died. He paid for our sins on the cross, and our faith is squarely in Christ alone for our salvation. And in that good news, this message of faith alone in Christ, to whoever believes you can be saved, he says, the power of God is demonstrated. The Greek word for power is dunamis. Uh, we get words like dynamite or dynamo from this Greek word. And it kind of has a dual meaning. Like dynamite is powerful, destructive power, okay? Dynamo is something that generates electricity. Uh, it's good, constructive power. So the gospel is like that. If you believe, you know, it's this constructive power that will save your soul for eternity. If you choose not to, it's like dynamite. It, it can destroy you because you refuse to believe. You rejected it, and you will be condemned. So it's the power of God. One way or the other, you need to understand. And this is what Paul says uh, he preaches without reservation. It's the power of God unto salvation. That's what this is all about. Salvation of the human soul. That is why Jesus came to earth. That is why he died on the cross because of you. You have an eternal soul that is worth far more than the whole world. Jesus said, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his own soul? He says, the whole world is not to be compared to your soul. And this gospel, this good news, is the power of God unto salvation of your soul, made in the image of God. He wants you with him forever. And you can choose. He gives you a choice. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who behaves. See, that's what most Americans say. You know, if you're good enough, you'll probably make it. But that's not what the Bible says. That's not the good news. The good news is it's to everyone who believes Amen. in Christ, in Jesus. Right. Jesus did the work. All we need to do is trust to believe. And that became the theme of Paul's preaching. Wherever he goes, he preaches this good news. And he says, I have confidence in that gospel. And then, you know, at the end here, he quotes a verse from the Old Testament. It's in Habakkuk 2.4. The just shall live by faith. 
the righteous one, the just one, the one who is right before God, will live by faith. The Bible says, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. You need to be holy. You need to be righteous. How can you stand before a holy, righteous God? Isaiah had a vision of God on his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And he says, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a un man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the land of a people of unclean lips. When we see ourselves compared to God, we're all unrighteous. We're all unholy. Even the prophet of God said, woe is me. So how do you get this righteousness? Well, the Bible says it's always been and it always will be and it is now by faith. The righteous one will live by faith. Now, it's not just in Habakkuk 2, 4. It's not just in Romans 1, 17. It's also in Galatians 3, 11, And it's again in Hebrews 10, 38. These concepts are so critical. This is a verse that uh, you need to know. This was the watchword of the Reformation. That became, you know, the wake-up call for, you know, millions of Catholics in 1500. And they started to hear and understand the good news, the gospel, and they realized it's by faith. It's not by works. It's for all who believe, not all who behave. And we need to understand that today. Every generation needs to understand this and <clears throat> find it out for themselves. 250 years ago, there was a missionary sent to Georgia, from London, England, and he went and preached under the trees there at a uh, port where the settlement had been set up. I've been there and seen the uh, very spot where he preached for eight years, but he got so frustrated and so discouraged, he got on a ship after eight years and went back to England. And on the way back, there was a storm, a terrible storm, and the ship was tossed, and he was terrified. But in the same ship, down in the hold where he was, there was a prayer meeting, song service going on by a group of believers called Moravian Brethren. And this young man could not believe that they were at peace in the middle of a storm. And it bothered him. I mean, after all, he was a missionary. For eight years, he had been preaching to Indians and uh, Native Americans and trying to serve the Lord. And yet, he didn't have peace in his own heart. He got back to London, and one day, one night, he went to a meeting at Aldersgate Street Church. And somebody was preaching on Romans 1. And they explained this, the just shall live by faith. And they explained the good news, that it's by faith. It's not by works. Well, he had been working. He had graduated from a divinity school. He had gone and served as a missionary for eight years. I read some of his sermons in those days. He knew the Bible. But this young man said by his own testimony, he said, I was not saved. But that night, he opened his heart to Jesus. He believed in the shed blood of Christ alone. And John Wesley became a Christian and changed the world. In 1738, when that happened, he started preaching the good news, the gospel, not just in England, but in America. And it became the great awakening of our country that shaped us into a Christian nation, the early founding fathers of our nation were affected by the preaching of the gospel. And there were tens of thousands of Americans uh, in the colonies who were coming to faith in Christ, starting to read and study the Bible, and realizing that that's what they wanted for their new nation. And our nation is in large measure who we are because of the gospel. Amen. 
in right. those early formative years. We're losing it. If we're not careful, we will lose it. But uh, God has done a thing in our country that the world envies. And uh, you dare not lose it. You young people, you need to rediscover this uh, message, this good news. Your mom and your dad, they found Christ as their Savior. That's why they bring you to church. That's why they want you to find it for yourself. And they want you to have it real, not just because they bring you and because they make you come or whatever, but when you have a choice to come or not to come on your own, you would choose to say, I believe in Christ too. He is my Savior too. I want this for me. And if you have a family someday, that you will pass it on to them and to your neighbors and to your friends at school and in your neighborhood. This is what every generation needs to rediscover, so to speak. And that's what Paul says, the just shall live by faith. Now faith, that word in, he, in Habakkuk 2.4 is one of two times in the Old Testament where the word faith occurs. In the King James Bible, the word faith is, is pretty rare. The concept of faith, uh, of trusting and believing, now that, that word is used hundreds of times. But the word faith itself is only twice in the Old Testament. But here in this book of Romans, Paul is going to be using this word 55 times in these next 16 chapters. And it becomes one of his favorite words. And the just, the righteous one, shall live by faith. How we get the righteousness from God through faith in Christ, uh, that too becomes a theme. The word righteous or righteousness is used over 60 times in the book of Romans. So get used to it. Faith and the righteousness that comes by faith is going to become a theme of the New Testament and the preaching especially of this uh, apostle, missionary, Paul. So what are the three I am's of Paul? I am obligated, I am eager to preach, and I am not ashamed of the gospel of God. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And with that message, Paul changed the then known world because it was a powerful message that changed people's lives. Wherever he went, there were churches established, and they shared it with everybody around them, and the message spread like wildfire. If you had the answer and you didn't share it, you would be criminal. There was a uh, disease that was going through the Amish community a few years ago. It was strange because children, perfectly healthy children, would get a fever, and in a few hours or days, they would be either brain dead or die. And a doctor realized it was something just to their community. It was something apparently in the genes that uh, this you know, community shared. And he figured it out. And he realized there was a very simple solution. If they would drink fluids and mixed with baking soda at the outset, at the onset of those symptoms, it would be cured. He said, I've got the answer. <laughs> I figured it out, whatever it was. You know, it's so simple. But how do you get the word out? Oh yeah, we're going to put this on the internet. <laughs> well, the Amish don't you know, they don't frequent the internet. So what do you do? He said, I've got to tell somebody. So he started going around to all the Amish communities in the country. And he would explain the very simple solution. And he would give out his card with his home phone number. And he said, if this happens to your child, you do this and you'll save their life. And if you have any questions, you call me. Now, how many doctors make house calls 
and then give you their phone number and say, you call me anytime, day or night. Well, he did, and he had the chance to save a generation of young people that were being afflicted by a simple uh, solution that God had given him. The answer was there, and he did what it took to get the message out. And you'll never hear about that sort of thing happening anymore because the word got out. And when people know this is life or death, and here's what you do, you know, they tell somebody. And we've got the good news of Jesus Christ, the salvation, the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. How can we keep that to ourselves? How can we not share it? We've got to share it and do whatever it takes. You know, go. Give them your phone number. Tell them to call me anytime. You know, that's what we're here for. Now we're in a difficult day and age with this coronavirus sweeping the world. And people are thinking and talking and asking questions. And you may be able to share your faith. Don't just say, well, you know, you've got to wash your hands. And you ought to do that. And don't blow your nose and sneeze on everybody, you know. You've you, you got to be careful about those things. But what people need to hear is the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for their sins. And they can have salvation for eternity. Amen. Not just for a few more weeks or months or years on this old earth, but for eternity. And we've got the answer. We're going to close with a hymn, 275. I surrender all. And let me encourage you to, first of all, make sure you're ready, that you're a believer, but then to be like Paul, ready to share the gospel with somebody else. Because you have a debt to pay. You, you owe them. You've got the answer they need. Let's stand as we sing. If you need to respond, you come. Always. Maybe you need to be saved. Maybe you need to commit your life to Him.
speakers, or do you have anything you need to go over with anybody? Well, I, I would share that I uh, spent time this weekend talking about security. We've been talking with everybody. This is the first service that we actually locked that door out there, put a sign. This was after the offering and whatnot. If locked, come to front door. And I had a sign ready for George Baker, who wasn't here this morning, only my sign stuck together. So I have to repatch up the one for first service because George has been concerned and would like this door locked when they're having the morning service. So again, it's just a little painted on plywood. When locked, use back door. And so that started the day with this particular service. And uh, the people that have expressed an interest, I've made up a list, there's an A team, a B team, and the whole idea is just making people aware when the church service is going on, and there will be people that will walk through and make sure that those doors do get locked, and just adding a presence of concern. But thank you for asking. I wasn't gonna say anything, but that's where we are right now. There's about 16 people on a list. Anybody can get on that list. It's just become aware. When we bring somebody in to talk to us, everybody's invited, so there's not to be any exclusion but there, I just have it as team A, team B, so it'll be like the first Sunday will be A, the next Sunday will be B, but those people will be cognizant of keeping an eye on things and doing a little security around the church. But thank you, Pastor. All right. And also for your security, we have uh, some hand sanitizer at both doors. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and we just encourage you not to shake hands and hug and kiss each other, you know, in in France, they have this thing where they kiss each other on both sides of the cheek. Don't do that either, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but we're glad you were here, and I hope you have a blessed week. And uh, don't forget our services business meeting on Wednesday night. And uh, you are dismissed. Say goodbye to my TV audience. <laughs>